So officially welcome everyone that uh, spared the time to join us for this uh, uh, free webinar with Simon Harris, uh, focusing on um, what's a program pro project program and a portfolio and how do they fit together. Uh, Simon will guide us through the presentation um, because there will be questions from a lot of the parties. I suggest that you type them in the chat window and we'll have a Q&A session towards the end of the webinar while Simon can uh, handpick some of the questions to answer during the presentation that he sees fits or that are in context with uh, the presentation flow that he has. Simon, can we go to uh, navigation of slides? Yeah, we can. Um, okay. So that's me. I don't think there's very much to say about me, except I'll, um, but I'll leave you to say what you want to. Well, I would say that there's a lot of things to say about Simon. Uh, he is a practitioner we've been working together with for the past three years, and he has more than uh, 41 years of uh, working experience, Simon. Yeah, that's scary, isn't it? Yeah. <laughs> um, he has been um, working in the project management field since 1979, and he's been in the PMO field since 98. Uh, he's a rare practitioner that uh, has worked with teams in project management at different levels from uh, project team members up to the CEO level or, or C-level in uh, um, big organizations and small. Um, he is one of the subject matter experts that collaborates with IPM Advisory that has one of the most versatile backgrounds in as far as industries are concerned. He has worked across multiple industries in the PPP and PMO space. Uh, he is uh, also a versatile contributor to different credentialing bodies across the world, whether that's in a position of writing or reviewing standards or publications. He has worked with uh, the Project Management Institute, AXA Loss, um, APM, IPMA, etc. And he has other community activities within the PMO space in the UK. Uh, he is the organizer of the PMO flash mob in uh, Scotland. And he's been a speaker on multiple uh, conferences and a renowned international uh, trainer and a consultant. That's in a nutshell something about Simon. Simon, would you like to add something? Um, I'll leave people to ask questions if they, um, if they feel they want to know more. They can stick things in the chat or whatever. I think probably um, covering uh, real content is more valuable to people. You've, yeah. you've nicely established that, that I've got half an idea what I might be talking about, and we need to establish who you are uh, and who we are as a community, and then we'll get into some real content. True. So this won't take long. Uh, I was already see some of the participants are already our clients. Uh, I see Muatas here, I see Amar. So most of them know um, about IPM Advisory. We are a uh, training, consulting, and advisory house that specializes in uh, PMOs and PPPs, but with a major focus on PMOs. And we organize um, a lot of events across the Middle East and Europe including Australia last year, that aim to get professionals certified in the PMO space. And we deliver all sorts of training and consulting to entities uh, that helps them build their capacity. So we've established presence on five continents in 19 different countries uh, and more than 21 cities now, as far as I know. Um, but I won't, you know, spend too much of the time explaining about IPM advisory. Everybody who wants to check us out, they can, uh, you know, visit our website and get in touch with us via different social platforms. Um, so I'll give this spotlight back to Simon so he can kick off the presentation. Thank you. And uh, as I said earlier, to reinforce uh, Alberto's point, if you've got questions, um, then either raise a hand, and if he's um, on the ball, he'll uh, he'll spot you, or stick them into chat, and we'll pick them up uh, either as we go or at the end, depending on how many questions we've got. We uh, we might need to do something uh, as a after the event thing, but I I'm going to pitch in now, and 
We've got a number of motivations in covering what we're uh, putting forward here. One for me is that I think organisations, and, and I come at this from both a project and programme manager, but also a PMO leader perspective, I think organisations struggle to understand what the differentiation is between the role of the portfolio program and project lead or participant and that makes being able to deliver service and um, deliver successfully more challenging and when we have clarity of what these things are we can see the roles are different um, we can cut through a lot of what's not clear I think the project management institute have not done us a favor with the portfolio program and uh, and guide to the PMBOK trying to cover the same content because they've looked at the process not the role so i'm going to start with some principles most of which i'm what i'm going to cover here is drawn from either what we do as pmo training or what we do in the three events that we're going to run next week which is governance complex projects of which covid is a very good example of the sort of stuff that drives complex projects and uh, recovering or, or perhaps also diagnosing uh, troubled projects. So here's a picture that is really the thing I draw on a flip chart hundreds of times in a PMO training course week, a triangle. And I'm a very graphically driven person, so there's colour in my pictures. And I'm going to give you the key here. Grey is business thinking. It's about why do we exist as a business? What are we trying to achieve? Blue is about the products and services that we sell to our customer base or otherwise deliver. We might be a government agency, ministry, etc. So we may have a value for money perspective rather than a profit perspective. And then red is activity and um, not in this diagram, but coming soon will be yellow for focus on quality. So there's my organisation with folk at the top who are concerned about why we exist, folk in the middle concerned about uh, keeping us existing, and folk at the bottom doing the, the hard work. So I'm going to label some of this with ultimate authority at the top, and then a little bit further down is that governance duty, for fiduciary duty, to keep the organization running safely in the best interest of shareholders and taxpayers. Then the leadership community and management community in the middle, whose role is to keep the business running day to day, week to week, including coping with the arrival of change, which prior to the recent few weeks worth of um, impact on our organizations and businesses, we would have been talking about marketplace based change. Ah, somebody's discovered the drawing tools. Um, yeah, you can draw. You can draw and raise um, raise interest if you want to. Um, obviously, exercise some social um, uh, responsibility. And if you draw on here, everybody sees it, which is fine by me. But um, next down is constancy of purpose. That's supervision, and that's first line management. And then the next level down from that is the daily operational. Um, dimension as I've already mentioned so that's my starting point from which I'm going to base most of the conversation at the bottom this is about follow best practice now if I'm a PMO I'm going to write procedure if I'm an organizational governance body I'm going to write procedure but that stuff doesn't work as we move up the organization there we need principles and values and we need the translation of strategy into tactics so we have to get the strategy from somewhere that's coming from higher up the organization so i'm about to start to define portfolio program and project in the context of vision and translation of vision and delivery of vision and that is one way that we could define it and if i'm a pmo lead that is one way i keep in my mind uh, who am i talking to and where should they be in the hierarchy of conversation about defining vision, translating vision, and delivering the translation. And for very many years, that's been suggested to us as a model that 
draws the triangle of the organization the other way up, which is why all the words are upside down in this picture. So we better turn them the other way around. And you may know this as the idea of servant leadership from a um, guy called Robert K. Greenleaf. Definitely something for you to go and look at if you don't already know his name. Uh, when you get the PDF of the slides, there's a link at the bottom of the screen here that um, will be an active link. I'm not going to click on it right now because um, that will take us off where we don't want to be. But I've just turned the triangle up the other way to say it's the folk at the top of the organisation who support everybody else by enabling people to make decisions and operate within a governance structure. And we'll talk for a couple of days about five or six hours worth of stuff next week on how do we make governance work. So if that's a topic of interest to you, if your organization um, either doesn't have what it recognizes as, as solid and good governance, or maybe you think you have and you want to verify that, then join us uh, later. Join us next week and we'll spend some time exploring it. Now, as we explore topics in training events like that, I hope they illustrate the two points that are made here. So I'm going to pause here. I'm going to introduce these challenges and I'm going to pause. So on the left, it says move two matches and reform the glass. So the coin is no longer in the glass, but you've still got the glass. Can you do it? Can you see the answer? If you can see it, um, just put something in the chat to say, hey, I solved that. And then move on to the other one, which is move one match and make a square. And if you can do that, put into the chat. I solved them both. Otherwise, put in the chat. No, I can't see how to do that. Now, since you're on mute, and since we have a large audience here, and in a training event, we'll have a smaller audience, and everybody would be not on mute, I'm reliant on you, on you putting stuff into... Um, um, into chat in order to be able to tell that, uh, that, the, that you're doing stuff. So I see a not sure. So Omar thinks he's got a solution, I think, to the one on the right, perhaps. Yeah, so well done. You had to look with the right eye to see that solution. And um, maybe, yeah, so some, ah, somebody says, I know the square. So you've seen it before. And in seeing it before, somebody's got the one on the left. Uh, on having seen it before, it's no challenge to do it again. But there'll be lots, yeah, there's lots of people looking at this saying, I can't see this. Uh, I'm going to show you the answers in a minute. So to, o, Omar says got the first one. So he's got both of them now. Here's what I hope a training course does. So uh, carry on try, uh, 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 experimenting with these. But it's been my experience that when I've worked with really good people, they have achieved aims. Got the one on the right. Well done, Alan. When I've worked with really good people, they have achieved aims that I could not see how to do. And when I've watched them working, I've said, as we've gone along and afterwards, that was so simple. Why couldn't I see that on my own before I watched you solve that problem? So often it's the politics of the organization or it's the achievement of things with multiple suppliers. And I, I've marveled that other people found problems that I found difficult to be easy and then I've watched them or I've worked with them or I've had training with them and I've said okay now I understand so we've got three three events running next week and I hope that they will do what I'm going to do now um, they'll take rather more than the two seconds this will take but if you watch the, uh, the if you watch the penny and the matches then um, there's the solution to the one on the left. And for all those folk who hadn't got it, don't beat yourself up that it was so simple. This is not about it was a simple solution. It's about it requires breakthrough thinking to move from where you are to a different situation. And 
the one on the right you'll have to watch very carefully you'll have to be concentrating but i'm going to move one match now and make the square and you may well say that's a cheat but there you go i'm going to undo it and do it again you have to be able to understand the nature of the problem you have to have good framing to have an understanding of the nature of the problem and i think if we can describe portfolio program and project and the role of the portfolio leader program leader or manager and project leader or manager whether we are um, the, the leader or the manager out in the uh, activities doing it or whether we are the pmo when we can frame things then it makes life a lot simpler for us so that was my object lesson and i've only got i've only got an hour here or in 40 minutes or so to take you through stuff so i'm not going to do anything else um, in terms of exercises but uh, be assured that when we get together to cover the other stuff we will do lots of it um, here's my color scheme so i'm going to i'm going to take you on a bit of a tour now i haven't noticed too many questions coming up in the chat which is fine by me uh, i don't think i've missed them but i do hope that if you're thinking of them, you'll save them to the end or, or stick them into the chat. So I'm going to take you through how I think we need to think about organisations. And in order to do that, we need, as it says at the bottom of the screen, we need leadership, strategy and benefits as a thinking area. We need deliverables, business management and business impact. We need del deliverable activity, which is actually where almost all textbook thinking seems to be focused and start and stop. We need quality and we need governance. And in the organisation, we have all of our business resources ideally being used to run the organisation and make profit. And at some point, pressure in the outside world builds up and triggers the need for mission and values to deliver a vision of reacting to pressures externally. And we really could have a case study conversation this week uh, in, in terms of what COVID's doing for us. But that requires that the leadership in the organisation at the portfolio level now has to start having a conversation with themselves about how do they cascade response. And actually, that means that we can't use all the resources of the organisation to run the organisation. We need some resources that are going to be used for change the organisation. And one of the things that that leads to in terms of the conversation and definitions I'm about to give you is that the portfolio level in the organization is about prioritizing demand on resource, which in my experience is the challenge that PMOs seem to struggle with the most. And may, we shouldn't struggle with it as much as we do. I haven't got enough time to tell you what the solutions are today, but we attempt to boil the ocean is the short short problem there um, if we have pressures on operations we end up with technical challenges those technical challenges lead to technical change we put projects in place and if we're going to talk to program community we need to recognize that there are behavioral and technical changes that will be necessary to deliver that and we can call it either a breakdown structure or a backlog i've labeled things here backlog that's about planning for resource management. It's about escalating up the chain of command. As a PMO, we should be assisting the rest of the organization to do the appropriate escalation so that monitoring and planning, whether it's agile or predictive, is using the resources in the organization at the bottom level to deliver products to their acceptance criteria that go into operation in business as usual and deliver benefits. Now that's a three minute conversation, a description of what's probably a good couple of hours worth of detailed conversation. I'm going to give it to you uh, in another format. I'm just reading Majid's comment. I suggest keep questions from the attendees to the end. Yeah, we'll definitely do a wrap up Majid at the end. Uh, if people put stuff in there that um, sounds like, or, or when I read it, I, I can respond to it immediately. I will. So that was a complicated picture, a little bit of simplification. Uh, it's about understanding the tension between operations and change that allows us to see across the organization at the portfolio level 
or it's about the journey left to right across the page here from the organization running in a stable business as usual fashion through change to on the right hand side stable business as usual now you might not have thought about it in these terms but business as usual runs to the sun and the moon we do things on annualized and monthly basis but we don't do that in projects in projects we do things on an event driven basis for example we get the qualification of an idea that says is this worth being a project and that requires that we think my triangle on the previous page being here the extent of required investment thinking uh, typically the extent of program thinking is rather more constrained rather rather more uh, limited and if as, as if as PMO uh, we are going to support the organization beyond just doing progress reporting out of projects then we need to be not the little extent of enlightened program thinking in this diagram but we need to be aware at the very least of the extent of the investment thinking and caring for the organization's use of all of its resources so qualification is about starting things off it's pre-commitment and our thinking at this point ought to be about the end point stephen covey said it nicely for us begin with the end in mind but i'm going to express it as changing uh, the organization from being in project state to going back to business as usual state so that's from change to run c to r and that's an approvals at senior level in the organization which is why this is a governance topic because it's about how do you put those approval processes in place and this slide is actually drawn from the governance course and it does say right at the bottom of the slide here uh, when we get back to work the how to is to ensure that your governance management plan section on reviews links the in project and in program and in operations to dialogue decisions quality concerns resourcing etc so that's three levels of the organization and three time frames so i'm not going into the detail of it here but i am signposting uh, in order to apply this stuff we need to constantly think what artifacts things like governance management plan do we produce and how do we use them and who are the people involved uh, i'm not going to go through all the detail that's in this picture uh, just to show you that there is a lot of detail but we do get to a sanction point and that sanction point uh, is a change from run the organization to change the organization and then we should do things like business planning technical planning that's normally the bit that organizations see as project sanction or project approval uh, it's a very small part of the thinking that we really need if we're going to be able to understand and run the portfolio side of things and then we get technical delivery and if we're an agile environment that happens maybe every 10 days uh, if we're a civil engineering environment or a heavy industry heavy industries environment that maybe happens once or twice a year or maybe once in five years or something think of delivering an oil field um, that the conversation all the time is about um, time to first oil uh, and that happens once obviously then we've got the business transformation so if we're going to be at program level we need to be having a conversation and some thinking about what happens when the technical stuff is over and yeah it's a complicated picture uh, again it's another it's an hour's worth of conversation and a rather less complicated picture to draw uh, to, to, to work through if we want to do it slowly but the essence of it is here uh, we come into a change initiative on the left with qualification we get we work up enough of a business case to do sanction sanction takes us into both technical and business planning and change and I don't care whether you're agile or not you still need to know where you're going and how you're going to get there then we have delivery then the technical stuff goes away and the business is left with integrating that change and then we go through transformation or absorbing or benefit flow and then eventually we say we declare victory and say we're back to operating uh, in a normal fashion uh, eb there is earned benefits and not in this course but there's a good link to some stuff on the project management institute's website about how to do earned benefits so that's a theme 
I want to just take that theme from a slightly different perspective for a second, which is this picture here. And you might read the title there that says, The Phone Rings in Sales. Now, perhaps you've worked in sales, but when the phone rings, it's a customer on the other end. And the customer says, can you? And the sales folk don't say, well, I don't think so. They say, yes, of course I can. And the customer says, um, well, sales obviously don't say no, because if they did, the customer just says, thanks very much. I'll try the competition. But the customer then says, well, it must be before and it must cost less than and sales continue to say no problem. And that's what arrives on the doorstep of many technical projects. A promise made to a customer that had absolutely no technical consideration in it at all. And that's because sales needed to capture the revenue stream that pays everybody's wages. So when that arrives down the bottom here with the technicians, um, the phrase that they of, often reply with is NFW, which of course stands for no way. What idiot promised this? And after a bit of thinking, they go, yeah, but what we could do, and the nearest I could get to that. So the challenge is that we have a business world and a sales world that runs right to left, the gray arrow at the top of the page. And we have a technical world that is quite convinced that the world runs left to right. And they're both in their own ways right, correct. So the program and project manager's role in the middle is to reconcile two different world views. And the reconciliation of those two world views is the challenge that they face that pro project management offices need to be equal to. Project management offices need to understand the challenges that the projects and programs community is dealing with and they need to be able to talk and interact with both the technical and the leadership community in the organization. And in both of those conversations, recognize that the fundamental um, assumptions that people make about the way the world works is different. And those two conversations, therefore, are not the same conversation, even if they're about the same topic. So at that point, I can now start to answer this question that we posed right at the beginning which is, well, what exactly is a portfolio? And what exactly is a program? And what exactly is a project? And the answer is there is no exact. Or part of the answer is there is no exact. The Association for Project Management, the APM, publish a body of knowledge that starts at the beginning by saying it's not sensible to talk about these things as discrete and separate. They are in a continuum. But the roles of the portfolio leader, the program leader, and the project leader, and then the portfolio program and project participant are different. So I'm going to give you these three definitions here, which I'm going to put a bit more content around. And I'm going to say that the purpose of a portfolio is the ongoing balanced use of resources to maximize benefits. And then I'm going to say maximizing benefits is a bit of a challenge because it splits between run the business and change the business. And it continues to be a challenge because it has to balance between short term and long term. I think the only realistic way to run the portfolio in most organizations is to adopt a Kanban approach. Now, Kanban isn't something that a lot of people know about. And it's certainly known about by um, a, a good body of people, everybody who understands lean knows what Kanban is about. It's a Japanese word that means notice board, which isn't very helpful for explaining to you how it works, and I'm not going to try in this <sighs> conversation. But at the top of the organization, we have balanced use of resources to maximize benefits. So we better have some way of getting those benefits into possibility, and that's the program. The role of the program is to initiate the flow of new benefits, and it's the role of the operations, the exec within the organization, to deliver those benefits day by day, week by week, moon, moon phase or month by month and year by year. So we're beginning now to link the technical change and the operational change because those are the bits that from the top down, and I haven't got the time today to talk to you about bottom-up driven change, but that is something we, I would include if I had more time. The top 
and the bottom up driven change is about understanding where we want the business to be. And then that's about having new benefit flows. And the delivery of those is about is the responsibility of the program manager. And if I'm a PMO where the P is program, or I'm a PMO where the P is department, is business unit, then I need to understand how to support people in the creation of business outcome. And that's two work streams, as I've already mentioned. It's the technical work stream and it's the business behaviours and change work stream. And those are both work streams that we could call projects. Although organisations tend not to wrap the business translation, transformation work stream. And I'm tr transformation is a bad word to use there because just at the moment we've got lots of organisations doing digital transformation programs. And I don't mean that sort of transformation. I mean bringing new capability into, into usage. And that bringing new capability into usage is a work stream that very often doesn't get recognised as a project. Uh, and I think if we had clearer definition of program, pro portfolio program and project, then the understanding of program would drive the understanding that we need projects that are about behaviour change, as well as projects that are about building technical um, deliverables. So there's the definition of project. It creates deliverables or delivers the enablers of benefits that programs then combine into usage. And now we've got a definition of portfolio, program and project. Now, if I didn't have a few more slides just to take some more perspectives, because I, I do think that agile is something that we need to put into context, we would perhaps have delivered on the promise that was on the title page, which is what's the difference between these things? So since that was the promise that's on the title page, I'm going to say it again. The role of the portfolio is to consider all of the uses of resources within the organisation and balance those across the short and the long term across run, which is about producing benefit today, and change, which is about producing benefit tomorrow. And we could now take a journey into Kaplan and Norton's balance scorecard because that would be good territory. We could take a journey into Kanban-based uh, enterprise-level work allocation because that would again be good. When we have a portfolio, we need to deliver the benefits into flow, and that's the programme. For the programme to do that, we need the technical and behavioural enablers, and those are the projects. Enablers. Sorry? Somebody said something. I didn't catch it. It's a bit ironic, really, but um, something as, um, with a, as bad a reputation as Prince is actually quite a good tool if you take away all the silliness that people have passing exams. Mm -hmm. But it's actually a good, it's a good structure. It's a framework. And there are a number of good frameworks out there. And I just want to share a little thinking with you about some frameworks. And the first bit of thinking is, how do I select the right framework? Because if we're going to do portfolio program and project, and then project is about delivering enablers, we need to understand the nature of those enablers developments and the nature of the politics in the organisation if we're going to be equal to controlling it. And here I am really thinking PMO perspective for a, for, for a moment or two. So on one axis, I'm going to put goal, and I'm going to say towards the left, it's clear and stable, and towards the right, it's VUCA, to use a phrase that people often use these days, volatile, uncertain, complex, and ambiguous. And I'm going to think about the expertise of the team, and towards the bottom, experienced and skillful, and towards the top, Unex, uh, uh, inexperienced and unskilled and on that label on that um, scale on the left hand side uh, COVID-19 would be at the top of the axis on the left hand side we fully understand what it is but we don't know how to fit how to solve it at the moment we don't know we don't have a vaccine for it etc so while we have an enormous number of highly qualified experts in their field as it stands at the moment, we do not know how to solve this problem, but we have a very clear statement of what the problem is. 
Uh, and this could be the conversation to have around things like complex projects, which is one of the conversations we will have later in the week. So we have two axes of uncertainty or certainty, and they should direct what framework we use to deliver our project program and portfolio. And the bottom left-hand corner is for simple projects. This is where our PMO analyst uh, with foundational training in things like creating dashboards and doing project uh, data gathering and report generation should understand how to operate. But that's not the whole world. That's where projects are a clear straight road on a sunny day. The COVID-19 thing is the clear goal where we are unclear about how to solve it. And that's the highly iterative approach with um, ideas that like from the lean startup, Eric Reese's ideas on uh, create safe to fail experiments and try not to fail. But if you are going to fail, fail quickly and gracefully. On the other axis, we have what's talked about very frequently, which is the uh, idea of, of agile and not talked about quite so frequently is the fact that uh, agile really only works in environments where you have skilled people and it's the goal that's not clear. Uh, I've just put some labels in on the left-hand side, alien stranger, repeater and runner, and I'll cover those in just a second. So agile is this little gray block that I've put in here at the moment. And the PMO challenge there often is, how do I use Agile skills in the PMO to run the PMO? And how as a PMO do I support Agile projects? Often when those project teams say, well, we're Agile, we don't need a PMO. And if I as a PMO, I can reply, well, actually, I can be helpful to you. Here's how. Then that improves both their throughput as a project uh, which then means that the organization is better enabled to deliver its programs, which means its portfolios deliver greater benefits. Um, so there's two challenges there, both of which I think that Alberto and I and, and our colleagues are um, able to move the matches for you, show you how to move the matches, show you how to create the squares and, um, and reform the, the glass with the penny outside it. These are for when... The, the, the road that we have to take is a very twisting one or every time you get to the top of the hill you find actually it's not the top of the mountain and, and there's more climbing that's ahead of you and there is one quadrant left which is the when the goal is unknown and the problem is not a runner we've seen it many times it's not a repeater we've done it before but we've still got risk it's not a stranger uh, we've uh, we know it's been solved, but not by us. Maybe it's an alien. Uh, we, we, we don't know that anybody's ever solved it, never been seen before. This is the complex projects environment. And people have known for a very long time how to deal with complex projects. It's a bit of a shame that Agile has had so much press in the last 20 years, because what was known about complex projects, I think, is less known now than it was then because Agile has rather overwhelmed some of the good knowledge that we had. But we do know how to, how to deal with complex projects. Um, you don't manage them, you lead them, and you give people the discipline of freedom. Uh, and I'm not going to say more about how to do it right now, except to say I'm going to spend a couple of sessions uh, next week, about five or six hours, taking people through how do you create the environment where the wisdom of crowds solves complex uh, problems. So there's two axes here, team access and customer access. And as a PMO, I need to know how to talk to uh, both communities. I'm going to put that almost coming towards the sort of end now. I'm going to put that in the context of both the waterfall life cycle and the iterative life cycle. Um, some product development life cycles are iterative i've got a better graphic in a second than this one um, on hindsight i might delete this graphic uh, not right now uh, other product delivery approaches are waterfall agile is evil um, evolutionary you can stop with value at any point in time but you don't generally get high integrity products as a result um, you need the concept of refactoring to 
deal with the integrity issues and that's expensive and slow and is the only way to proceed in some environments and so is a tool to have in the toolbox. If you can do things on a waterfall approach, then you end up with high integrity products, but you also end up with the situation that if you fail, you fail completely. I would not want to live near a nuclear reactor that had been built using an agile approach. I do think people who use waterfall approaches to do things like build uh, websites for customer engagement are losing to their competition because they are not fast enough. So the question is, understanding when is which life cycle the most appropriate. So they have different strengths. The waterfall approach is high integrity. That's a strength. It's late breakage, all or nothing. They're weaknesses. The agile environment, it's iterative. But the key message here is from a governance at program and enterprise level, I don't care because all I do is impose upon the top of either approach the gated structures that we use for project control, program control, um, portfolio control. And as a PMO particularly, but as an exec in the organisation, I need to understand how I put governance and control on top of the project or program, particularly program, and I don't care whether the people who are being technical use Agile or Waterfall. It's irrelevant to me. It's particularly irrelevant to me when I start looking at tools for dashboard creation and I start thinking about whether I do Extract Transform Load or Extract Load Transform, uh, ELT or ETL. Uh, there are tools out there that plug in. Microsoft have a whole bunch of them on their website um, that that plug into our projects and generate the data and allow us to produce the information that's required for decision makers. That slightly better graphic that I said I had is this one here. So there's at the top is my waterfall approach, investigate, design, build, integrate, accept, deploy, and maintain. If you stop anywhere halfway through this, you've got nothing. Um, but actually there's lots of little work packages in each of those phases. And I'm going to go through the governance structure. That's the previous slide. Qualify, sanction, deliver, close project, project closure, eventually benefits being earned. And I've got various stakeholders uh, involved. Those folk with, the head in their, with their heads in the clouds might be my senior leadership. I've got my project sponsor there, perfect, perfectly juggling golden balls. And I've got my project manager there. At juggling hot potatoes and dropping the odd hot potato. But I could restructure that piece of work and do it in an agile fashion. And when I do that, I deliver much earlier, but it takes a lot more time and effort to deliver everything. But time to first delivery much quicker. Time to last delivery longer, probably more expensive. My governance structure is not quite the same, but it's very similar. I've done qualification and sanction together at the same point. And then I deliver and deliver and deliver and deliver and deliver. And I close the project at some point. But I don't have to wait till right out here to check whether I'm getting any benefits. That benefit checking is done much, much earlier. But maybe I still need to do some benefits checking at the end. Um, end is probably the wrong word. But that second set of benefits checking has taken a portfolio view because it's beyond project. It's saying, am I getting the benefit flows? This is a program level um, concern and consideration. So one works for projects where at the beginning I can see clearly to the end. The other works for projects where every time you come to think you've solved it, you find there's another challenge ahead of you, another twist in the road. And all of this needs to feed into that place where we started at the beginning, which is, how do we get from mission and values through to projects executing? And it's a cascade down the organization normally. Mission leads to vision. Vision leads to uh, outcomes at head of function type levels. And then that leads to strategy and tactics at project level. And we use things like um, the PMBOK the uh, Agile Manifesto and the Prince Manual and anything else you like to deliver our projects. 
and we have time frames that might be a five year plan or a or a twelve week or a twelve month plan. We might produce products that have a lifespan like a mobile phone of three months before you need a new product out there, or you might have a product like an oil field with a lifespan of fifty years uh, or something similar and we know at the business direct level so what i've put in the gray box at the top left hand corner this is um, the sort of things that we need to talk to pmo leaders pmo directors and organizational execs about how you support the portfolio uh, and that's a conversation in what why how when who etc and that cascades down the organization uh, pmo manager courses and pmo analyst courses it's all part of the same picture but the conversation that we need is a little different um, and I haven't tried to fill those in in, in, entire, in their entirety, but we have content to have those conversations at those levels. So if we move over to the right-hand side of the page, the conversation we have at the, at the leadership level is uh, how do we get program sanctioned versus strategy and resources? The conversation we have at the uh, PMO analyst level is how do you do things like gather project status data? So a lot that could be filled in there if it wasn't a, such a short conversation. So portfolio, program and project are the changes to our organisation, the way it evolves. This has been a very short conversation. I've really covered most of it with you in 30 minutes. Uh, it represents, as Alberto said at the beginning, um, more than 30 years worth of trying to work out how this stuff works and, and do it. I do now feel that it's very easy to describe the component parts. I still feel it's very hard to go and do it in organisations, but I do feel that having clear models of what are the components and how do they interact with each other makes it much easier for us to be able to either as programme lead project lead or PMO lead to start to put the right structures for governance and management in place. And those ideas about how do we do governance um, will be discussed about this time next week uh, and the following evening. Uh, the ideas about how do we deliver the complex project will then be the next two days. And uh, how do we rescue it when it goes wrong will be the next two days. And before you think, well, surely we shouldn't ever need to talk about the how do you rescue it when it goes wrong because it's never going to go wrong. I'll quote something else to you, which I think comes from the guy who did the light bulb. Is that Thomas Edison who said um, that in discovering the light bulb, uh, if well, what he, what he effectively said was if you're not failing routinely you're not trying hard enough and it's been my experience that when i could happily deliver a million dollar project people ask me to do five million dollar projects and when i could do five million dollar projects people ask me to do 20 million dollar projects so it's the stress level that remains constant not the success size so we don't get to a situation where we don't need to rescue troubled projects because every time we get competent to a project of some size, our appetite from the salespeople saying yes to the customer grows. So I am done in terms of covering stuff with you. Alberto might like to say a few words at this point, and then we'll move to Q&A, and we'll do that for, for as long as seems um, uh, moderately uh, sensible to do it. Goody, do you want to um, do you want to expand on you think there's a cost, or did you mean for the ver for the sessions that are coming next week? Because yes, there is a cost for the sessions that are coming next week. <laughs>